All right, good evening. Um, thank you for coming out tonight. I'm Kristen Lazaro, the Director of School Counseling for the District, um, but I do spend a lot of my time in the high school and middle school. So for tonight, we've organized because if you are juniors or even sophomores, um, it's starting to be that time to start think about thinking about colleges and doing some visits. So it's the perfect time to also bring in some college admissions people and have them tell you a little bit about the process, not necessarily specifically about their schools, but just about the process in general from you know knowing that they are admissions people and what they see and how that runs. So I have a set of specific questions that I will ask them. And then there's a few toss-up questions, and then there'll be time for your questions after that. OK? All right, so we're going to get started. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, and we'll start with Erica, if you could just go down and introduce yourself and where you're from. Yep. So my name is Erica Harenstein, and I'm with North Shore Community College. My office is in the Danvers campus. I'm Bill McMurray. I'm a Northern New England Regional Representative for Roger Williams University. I live in Portland, Maine, but I work with students from Essex County. Hi, I'm Mary Dunn. I'm the Executive Director of Partnership and Collaboration at Salem State University, previously the Dean of Admissions at Salem State University. And I'm Jacqueline Dachara, the Assistant Director of Undergraduate Admissions at UMass Lowell, and I'm actually a Hamilton Wenham graduate myself, so it's good to be back. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ken Sawada. I'm here from Syracuse University in the Office of Admissions, and I live regionally uh, in New England. I live in Boston. Hi, I'm Kate Brown. I'm an assistant director at Northeastern. All right, thank you very much. So we're going to begin with Ken. Um, so Ken, the application numbers are overwhelming these days. How can an application stand out, and how do admissions people handle all of them? Yeah, application numbers are certainly um, rising for, for some schools, and for us, we topped the 35,000 mark for the first time this year, not like 60,000 <laughs> at Northeastern or BU, um, but quite a bit. And uh, we have 40 plus staff members in our office to read all the applications. So, and we have an incoming class of about 3,600, which is our goal. So it does take a lot of careful review of each file. Um, as most of us have, um, you may hear this often, but we have a holistic review process where we're looking at not just GPA and test scores, but other factors as well, like the rigor of your course load, um, perhaps supplemental items like a portfolio or an audition, depending on the type of major that you're going for. Um, but I know that one of the points that we're, we wanted to make was how to stand out amongst all of those applications uh, for the schools that you're applying to. Um, there is some schools, and some schools may not care about this, but it's something that we do care about, and it's demonstrated interest. Um, this could be a number of different, you could show this in a number of different ways, whether it's visiting a campus or um, doing a tour, but you could also do it from the comfort of your own home as well. Um, staff members like us will come to your high schools, like we'll do an information session um, at Hamilton Wenham in the fall, and so just attending that would be also showing demonstrate interest. You could apply early to a school, um, early decision or early action, and that could also show interest as well. And some schools may offer interviews, and that may be one way where you can make that personal connection and speak more about yourself to an admissions representative. Um, and one more way too is making that connection with your admissions person from your area. So if, for example, if you have interest in any of our schools, I would definitely encourage you to, you know, to talk to us afterwards um, just to find out more about our school and to develop that rapport with us. Great, thank you. Bill, how important is the college essay in the application process? What makes a good or not so good essay? <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, any question that starts with how important is, the answer is gonna be it depends. Um, <laughs> because institutions have different ways of doing things, different levels of competition for spaces and so forth. Um, and it's sort of ironic to talk about the essay on what is in effect one of the first times that many of the students in the room probably have, ever, have even begun to think in an organized way about the college search, but not really because the, one of the goals of the college essay from our point of view is to, uh, to see that, you've had, that you're self-aware to some degree, that you've learned something or that you know something important about yourself that you can relate to one of the topics in the common application. And this is a great time to start thinking that way. Think about, in preparation for writing an essay uh, a, you know, in a few months, 
um, you, you can begin now by thinking about, uh, have you had one of those aha moments? Or is there someone that you think back on in your life that's been particularly influential? Um, those kinds of uh, uh, reflections are gonna show up in an essay that's gonna be meaningful. Um, rather than simply describing something else. Uh, we want to hear something about you that you've discovered or learned about yourself. Um, obviously, solid grammar and spelling and writing. Um, try not to use words that you think are going to impress, but that don't, really don't have much place in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, it, it sticks out. It, se it seems awkward. Speak, in your, speak and write in your own voice. And one tip that I've, I've picked up over the years that really works for students I've worked with is when you've, when you've come to what you think is a draft of your college essay, uh, go in a private space, take out a voice recorder and read it out loud and then listen to it yourself and see how it sounds and I'm, I guarantee you, you'll make changes. Uh, That's a great tip. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Kate, how do I make a list of colleges and universities to apply to? How can I tell a university that I'm interested? Yeah, so I had some of my own tips for this one, but I also talked to some of our current students at Northeastern to see how they kind of narrowed it down. And kind of the biggest theme I saw from those students was to keep an open mind. So I think when you guys are feeling the pressure of thinking about colleges, it may be easy to compare yourself to other students or to go with only what you have heard about one school. Um, but there are thousands of schools out there, some you may not have even heard from. Um, and just because you haven't heard of them doesn't mean they're not great. So really do keep an open mind. Our students suggested and we suggest that you think about the size of the school you want and maybe visit a few schools of different sizes. Think about the location you want. Do you want to be in a rural place for four to six years, generally four? Do you want to be in a big city? Are you hoping for that traditional campus residential atmosphere or are you okay with you know maybe taking a bus to get to some of your classes or something like that um, one of my students also said choose a school or start looking for schools where you see role models and people that you would like to be similar to when you get older and so a place where you can really see yourself and then in terms of demonstrating interest Ken talked a little bit about it and so I would just go along with what he said but it's everything from signing up on the mailing list to talking to your admission counselor um, coming to meet with us when we come to your school school we are really happy to always chat with you and like Ken said some schools track interest more um, in a more formal way than others so you can even ask your admission counselor if that's something they're looking for great thank you Mary what are the state guidelines for admissions to state colleges and universities generally the, the standards are pretty direct um, it doesn't mean that if you meet the standards you are guaranteed admission though that's one thing I think we need to be clear on. So we, had, we have particular courses that we require, four years of English, four years of mathematics, including one in the senior year. So if you already had five courses and you didn't take one in the senior year, then you did not meet standards. We need to have four math courses plus one in your senior year, or in addition, or as well as. Um, science, we want three lab science courses. So we need to make sure that the students are taking courses that, that are needed. Two courses in a foreign language, same language. So you can't do a French and a Spanish. It needs to be two Frenches, two Spanishes, whatever. Uh, U.S. history, two social sciences. One must be a U.S. history. The other can be whatever the high school allows for social science. And then two electives from the above. So obviously we want more than that, but that is the minimum course numbers. The SATs at Salem and at many of the state universities are, we are test optional. So what that means is you can check off a box on your application saying that you want to be test optional and then you will not have to submit your test scores. However, what you can do is check the box off and submit your scores. Because there are students who we will admit with scores and we, there are students that we cannot admit if they check off the test optional box and they don't send them. So there's varying methods. So I would tell you that you can do either one or the other. It doesn't matter if it's an SAT or an ACT. And if that's confusing, I'll be happy to clear that up a little bit. Um, in nursing and other majors are more competitive than some others. So in general, if you have a 3.0, the proper coursework and uh, a test optional SAT or nursing requires an SAT, then that's what we're looking at. We do not require an essay. If you choose to send one, students, 
uh, at Salem, I think at most of the state schools that don't require one, it should say something like, as you will see when you review my application, I. Because, you know, we don't really need something that, that it just whatever you're thinking. Uh, unless it's telling us about you personally, I don't think I would send an essay. Letters of recommendation are not required, but if you want to send one, that's fine. We may or may not read them, uh, and that's pretty much the process. Pretty simple. Application, transcripts, and uh, maybe or maybe not SAT scores. All right, thank you. Erica, what are the benefits associated with attending a community college? Yeah, so there's a number of benefits. Um, we work with students who really could go anywhere. They could be 4.0 and simply budget conscious. Um, there's a number of students that we've met with that are, you know, they know their career path and they simply want to begin at a community college knowing that they'll transfer out and complete their bachelor's and maybe more after that time. Um, it's also great for the student who maybe didn't do as well in high school as they had hoped and it can be a really great fresh start. Um, you start at the community college where there, the application process for general admissions is the online application and proof of your high school graduation and there you are. You're, you're enrolled and you can register for college level classes and really begin <coughs> fresh. So there's, there's also, um, well we'll talk later about the mass transfer program, but I think those are really the key um, benefits to beginning. A lot of it has to do with budget. Um, the student who wants to work while they're attending college, they want to stay local. Um, it's super flexible when it comes to daytime, evening, part-time, full-time. Um, you're paying for the credits that you register for. Um, there are students who might only be on campus a couple of days a week. They may um, alternate again from part-time to full-time. You know, each semester you're not locked in. We have online classes as well as hybrid, and um, that flexibility can be a huge benefit to the student who either wants or needs to work while attending school, wanting to save money and continue on for their bachelor's down the line, potentially. Um, also a great choice for the student who just doesn't know where they want to end up or what their career path will be. Um, we have a number of students who will begin with us in the liberal arts program and sort of explore college level classes, determine what their interests really are at the college level and, um, you know, decide from there if they're going to continue on and in what career path. Great. Thank you. Jackie, how important is the senior course selection for current juniors? So senior course selection is important, um, and that's because for UMass Lowell, and I'm sure a lot of my colleagues up here, everyone would agree that the high school transcript does play the largest role in the application process in the admissions review. So your senior year courses are the last, is kind of your last chance to prove yourself as a student uh, before you start college. So these are the last grades that we will see. Um, you'll also want to do research on what the college you're applying to requires. Um, for UMass Lowell students that are uh, looking at our engineering and sciences, a lot of our STEM programs we're requiring students have completed pre-calculus or calculus at their senior year. Some colleges require this regardless of major. Um, if you're looking at nursing or one of our, the health sciences fields, um, maybe taking anatomy or a statistics course in your senior year, as that will benefit you once you get into that program. Um, so really depending on the program that you're looking at and what, what courses are available. And then I would say the rigor of your coursework. So Mary just did a nice job of describing what the minimum requirements are for a lot of institutions. But you can always take that third or fourth language um, instead of taking a elective course that isn't going to um, help you in your, co in your college uh, major. So taking that third or fourth uh, language course or another history course or again um, taking that math class. And then rigor also looks at if you're taking college prep level courses um, or are you challenging yourself in your senior year by jumping up maybe to an honors course in a subject area that you've done well in um, or maybe by taking a few AP courses in, in the classes that you're excelling in, um, as that will help you when we process your, recalculate your GPA on your transcript, and it will help you to transfer in courses. Um, if you do well on those AP exams or you've taken a dual enrollment courses, you can transfer that into the institution. Great, thank you. 
Ken, what is an early application, um, when is an early application appropriate? What are the different early plans? And does every college have them? Is it better to apply early action versus regular decision? I think it depends on the school. So schools have different philosophies on what they offer. Um, different types could include early decision, which is binding. So if you are admitted to that school, if you apply early decision, you are required to ultimately attend that school. There's also early action. Um, early action is non-binding, um, but you would get a decision uh, sooner. And then there's regular decision, and then also rolling decision. The school that I used to work for was, was rolling decision, where we gave out decisions within about two weeks of when we received all of the materials. Um, let's see. Oh, so some, OK, let's start with some pros and cons. So pros for applying earlier. Um, one is that the process would conclude sooner. Like, for example, if you're applying to us early decision, you would know by late December, um, as opposed to regular decision where a student might be finding out just now uh, what their decision is to our school. Um, so the timeline is, is a lot quicker, so you'll have a little bit more freedom uh, during the spring semester. Um, another pro, I would say, is that you're showing that demonstrated interest towards the school. You're showing the school that you want to commit to them, um, and so I think that uh, can be valued at certain schools. Some of the drawbacks, uh, one would be um, financial aid. Because when you're applying early decision, uh, you may not be seeing that financial aid package for that institution. Um, so you want to make sure that it's a financial fit, that the school is a financial fit for you if you are applying early. Um, another drawback is that if, if your grades perhaps are below par for that school, you won't have you won't be able to submit senior year, like mid-semester grades, if you're banking on that senior year to, to up your GPA. Um, so that's something to consider as well. It does seem like there is a trend of more students applying earlier. Um, so it is making it more competitive, I think, than it used to be. Um, but the biggest thing I want to stress is that it's up to the student. It's, it's a fit for you, and you, we don't want you to feel pressured by, just because someone else is applying early, that you shouldn't feel like you have to apply early. So it depends on your research and what you find, and if you need that extra time to, to do this research, I mean, you're, again, you're committing for four years, four to six years, four, four, hopefully four years, um, for that, what you're gonna be doing for college. So you know, we definitely wanna ensure that you're making, you're doing it on your own time and not pressured by outside factors. Great, thank you. Bill, what role do GPA and overall scholastic achievement play in the admissions decisions? Well, pro probably the best way to illustrate that is if I'm spending 20 minutes on reviewing an application, I probably spend 12 to 15 minutes on the transcript alone. Um, I think the general rule of thumb is that a higher GPA is almost always better than a lower GPA, but I think it's almost also true that not all 3.7s are created equal, so we have to look just beyond the numbers. Um, to the real achievement, as you say, and that comes in a lot of forms. We look for balance. Uh, like Mary said, all of the different food groups, have they been represented throughout the four years of the student's program? What about the rigor? Have they challenged themselves with more rigorous advanced honors, advanced placement, international baccalaureate courses, anything like that? Um, how has the performance been, and how has that performance varied from year to year, from subject to subject? Um, and so forth. So we're really combing over the transcript with a number of different, uh, or uh, mix my metaphors, a number of different lens lenses. Um, but our bottom line is to determine this student's potential for success at our institution. Um, I think it's important to think of, a, of an admission letter not as a reward for what you've done in high school, but as an incentive for what we believe you can do in college. Um, so, but with that in mind, uh, like I said, higher GPAs are better and you can always be your best scholarship because the GPA number does matter a lot to a lot of places in this process. They're used as, uh, to create bands of, of students as we review to, to see you know, where uh, different categories of students academically might fall on other scales. Uh, they're used, uh, unfortunately, sometimes with artificial levels of precision in calculating merit scholarships and things like that. Um, so it's never too late to start to improve your GPA. 
Thank you. And uh, just if we can just go down, um, a lot of people ask, this is off script, but a lot of people ask, uh, do colleges uh, recalculate GPAs? Um, and so, Kate, just starting with you going down, could you just let us know what that process is at Northeastern? And Yep, so we recalculate every single student's GPA. We give a weight of 1.4 AP, half a point for honors, or whatever the equivalent is at your school. Um, and it is the territory manager's role to understand if your school does not offer APs or that kind of thing so we can understand what that GPA looks like. We'll recalculate if not on a 4.0 scale. We'll recalculate every GPA and transcript that comes in. Um, similar to how Northeastern does it, uh, we weight honors and dual, or honors courses and then dual enrollment and AP courses the same weight, um, and we put everybody on that 4.0 scale as well. And we recalculate every single student's academic GPA uh, as well. At Roger Williams, we take the GPA that the school provides us, but we also note in a separate part of our system whether that's weighted or unweighted, and then we also have a separate uh, five-point Likert scale for the rigor of the curriculum as well. So we recalculate again only if um, it's not a 4.0, you know, based on a 4.0, um, but we also don't have a minimum GPA. We just require high school graduation. Great, thank you. Kate. What are the advantages associated with cooperative or experiential edu uh, sorry, education, those programming? Yeah, so if those of you are familiar with Northeastern, you know that experiential learning is kind of our thing. Basically what that means is we think learning does not and should not only happen in the classroom. So throughout your time at Northeastern, we want you to have real world experiences and kind of weed those connections back into the classroom to further inform your learning and then also go back. So we do have the co-op program. Um, it's a six month full time employment opportunity. It is not an internship. You are not taking classes. You are solely focusing on that six month employment. You can do that up to three times during your time at Northeastern. So when I say four to six years, we have a lot of fifth year students because they've done three co-ops. They're not paying any extra because they haven't paid tuition. Um, but we find that it kind of helps students do one of three things. They either come back from co-op and say, um, I did not like my co-op and I don't think my field of study is right. They come back and say my co-op wasn't the best fit, but I think this really, you know, is kind of the right area that I want to be in, or they come back and they say, this is great, I figured it out, and we really want to avoid students getting into their first job with kind of false expectations and being miserable right out of the gate. We also think the advantage is that our students are graduating with so much real world experience that they really stand out in terms of their graduate applicant pools and in terms of their first job, um, over 50% of our students receive job offers from previous co-op employers. Many, uh, much of the time, it's even before they graduate. Um, so we think it's kind of two-pronged. One, these students are really figuring out what it is they do want to do, but also two, we're, we're really preparing them for success after they graduate. Great, thank you. Mary, what value are previous summer internships of volunteer work in the college I'm sorry, what value are previous summer internships of volunteer work in the college admissions process? Like what value was given to them? It's a tough question. Um, because the state universities really look at the academic high school transcript first and foremost along with the level of coursework. It kind of goes in line that same thing as I talked about when students send in letters of recommendation, uh, or personal uh, resumes and number of years they've done things. So I think it does matter because if we're looking for something else, we can look there and see if it's there, but it is not a requirement. And so if a student, you know, we have so many students in, in the admissions world who will say things like, did the, you know, lung cancer walk? And, but it doesn't say like, how, how many times did you do it? How much money did you raise? Like, what is the importance of us knowing that? So if you are gonna submit some kind of a resume, a life resume, you need to tell us what you added to that so that it can make a maybe, a, a, not a difference in your application decision, but just a way to, for us to look at you. Great, I don't know thank if that you. answers the question. Then. Yeah, that's good, thank you. Um, Erica, could you tell us a little bit about the mass transfer program, please? Yep, so um, our students do transfer to private and state universities um, after completing, you know, certificate or associate's degrees. But the mass transfer program is a state program, and it's designed for students who begin at the community college level to transfer to any state school in Massachusetts. So the UMasses, Salem State, Fitchburg State. 
um, programs like that. So with a 2.0 or higher, students are guaranteed for their, their credits to transfer. And a 2.5 or higher, they're also guaranteed acceptance to a state university. Um, a 3.0 or higher, they also qualify for a mass transfer credit. Um, it's a tuition rebate, 10% back. Um, so there's, students can take that one step further. Again, a lot of our students are there because they're figuring things out. Um, they may know or they may not know that they ultimately would like a bachelor's degree. Um, students who you know, start with us, a lot of them like the idea that when they have their associates, they have that option to decide to continue on or not. We also have students who come to us knowing where they want to go next. Um, again, those budget conscious students who um, come to North Shore, they do well, they do the Commonwealth Commitment Program. So that's sort of taking it one step further where they decide within the first year with us where they're going to complete their bachelor's. So um, basically there's, a, there's paperwork for this particular program and what they're committing is that they'll maintain a full uh, full-time status and they'll maintain a 3.0 GPA or higher and they're also committing to a particular school and so they're also locked in at tuition um, for that four-year school at that time so that's the additional benefit um, of the Commonwealth Commitment Program. So again, that happens, you know, working with academic advisors at some point in the first year of school for students who are looking for that and, and who do know what their next step will be and who do plan to maintain that GPA and to maintain a full-time status. Other students, again, um, would like to remain flexible and, you know, kind of appreciate that opportunity when they do complete their associates, whenever that may be. Great, thank you. Thank you. Jackie, what is the role of technology in the admissions process? Does social media ever become a factor in admissions, either in a positive or negative way? So both are very good questions. Um, I'll tackle the first um, about technology. Uh, every admissions office up here uses technology. Um, every time you fill out an inquiry card, it goes right into our system. Um, we're using a, a CRM so that we can track how many times you've opened our emails. So I know um, some people talked about demonstrated interest earlier. So if you're um, responding to emails or you're clicking through the links that we're sending you, if you're um, signing up for tours, all of this is tracked um, and could be a part of your application review. So some schools um, might use demonstrated interest more than others, but this is something that we all have the technology to track this data um, and it's just up to those universities how important that um, demonstrated interest really does become. We all probably also have Facebook for um, our universities, Twitter accounts, Instagrams, uh, we have Snapchat for UMass Lowell, uh, the university has one and the admissions office has one. So following those can be useful because we post a lot of um, quick links, information about deadlines, events on campus, um, and just what's going on for uh, current students. We, we highlight some students' co-ops or, or where they're doing research, and then about um, visits for students to uh, come, come see the campus, come to an accepted student's day or a tour, or shadow a student in music or engineering. Um, so following along with our, our social media can be very beneficial. Um, and then I know we receive over 11,000 applications. Sounds like Northeastern has over 60,000 applications. I can't check every student's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram account while I'm evaluating your application. It's just not worth our time. Um, but what I will say is once you're accepted on campus, you're invited to a closed Facebook group that is all accepted students and what you post on there is monitored. Um, I think we've all heard of students that um, they have lost their admission to a university because they posted something on their Facebook account or um, I just heard about a student that lost their admission because they threatened someone through Twitter. So just be mindful of what you're putting out there um, even if you have a private account not everybody's nice in the admissions world, so your friend that didn't get into the school could screenshot it, could get into the wrong hands and be sent to us. And each admissions office has a different way to deal with something like that, but you just would never want to jeopardize your future at a college because of an angry tweet or Facebook status. So just to be mindful of what you put out there. Great, thank you. 
Uh, Ken, how does a college know about Hamilton Wenham? I think for myself, when I first started at Syracuse, I was given reams of data and statistics on um, high schools and our application numbers. Um, and I cover the New England area, so I have a finite number of space to, for school, to hit schools. Um, but I noticed right away that we have a handful of applications from Hamilton Wenham, and of those typical five applications, we usually get one or two students who enroll each year, um, which is a pretty good yield rate. So for us, like that's what drew me to, um, to come here. Um, and I, I've had great experiences doing information sessions here with quality students, good energy. Um, but the biggest thing for me is the, the time spent from your staff. Um, the guidance staff here, I remember the first time I came here, uh, he's now ret since retired, but I remember he was talking to me about um, how he should guide me towards my career, um, which I thought was really nice, and we were just talking about um, just random things like that. And um, uh, Mr. Fitzgibbons, who sat in on my last two information sessions when I've been here, and you know, we talked about upstate New York. So just the pro professional relationships, um, being on a panel in the past, and Ms. Lazaro was there uh, for that. So just the, these professional connections that your staff is, is making with, with us, I think is really important um, and gets, gets Hamilton Wenham out there as well. Great, thank you. Thank you for the kudos too. <laughs> I'll make sure they all know. <laughs> um, Bill, how important are letters of recommendation in the college admissions process? It depends. Uh, <laughs> uh, some colleges don't require letters of reference, some require one, uh, some require two teachers and a counselor, so it behooves all students to understand what's, what's expected and whether or not you can go beyond. Most of us will say, you know, sort of carefully that, yes, if you want to submit one, maybe two additional references from people who know you well, coaches, clergy, employers, people like that that are outside the school community, that's okay, but don't overdo it. Um, whether anyone who requires them, uh, we're very hopeful when we start to read them. Uh, they, most of them, unfortunately, turn out to be less valuable, I'm afraid. They, they tend to be generic and they tend to be uh, annotated resumes uh, through the eyes of a teacher. She's been such a great captain of the lacrosse team, yada, yada, yada. I mean, that's all well and good, but we see that in other parts of the application. What I'm really looking for is comments from a teacher about that student's overall academic attitude, uh, his or her proficiency in the subject matter at hand. Um, and any special facts that that teacher may know through a relationship. Maybe the teacher has also been the advisor of the chess club or the coach of the volleyball team or something like that. Um, unfortunately, the, 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 reference, the references that provide that kind of information are few and far between in reality. So I would urge the students in the room to don't always rush to the teachers who gave you the straight A that you didn't really interact with very much. Uh, when, you, when you're faced with having to ask a teacher to write a reference, try to choose a teacher who knows you well. Maybe you've had more than one class. Uh, maybe you've actually let your hair down and been yourself in front of him or her in the hallway or after class sometime, and they might be able to offer some meaningful commentary about who you are as an academic citizen of the school. Great, thank you. Kate, which admissions test is better, ACT or SAT, and is the writing component, component an admissions factor at your school? Yeah, so this is totally just about Northeastern, so I encourage you to reach out to your counselors at other schools to see if they have a preference. Um, sometimes people see that they fare better on one than the other, so that can also be a personal thing. For us, we do not care if you take the SAT or the ACT. Either one is totally fine. We do require it. We will super score it. We do not look at the writing sections, and we also do not take subject tests. Again, this is completely dependent on the university. It is not universal across all schools, so definitely check in to see which are required, but that is how North Eastern handles those. Uh, maybe we can just go down the panel uh, if it, it, super scoring or kind of go on with what Kate had just presented. So for Syracuse, everything she said is, is, the, same, <laughs> is the same for us. Um, one exception, we do have visual and performing arts programs, and for those we don't require test scores, but it's only for those majors. So we're test optional, and I think Mary will get to that in a moment. Um, but if you are submitting test scores, if you choose to submit those, we super score and we'll take either. Um, typically, if a student takes the SATs and the ACTs um, and they do better on one, then they have the opportunity to t retake that one in the fall before um, applications are due. And then that way, if they do better in one section, the schools will super score them to create that higher score. 
same thing. Really. <laughs> uh, except for nursing, we do require the SAT scores or ACT scores for nursing applicants. <clears throat> Roger is completely test optional. Um, I, had an, I had another point I was going to Oh, for uh, admission and for merit scholarships as well. But for those who do submit, we do super score everything, including the ACT. And I would say that if you tell us on your, on your uh, Roger member page at the Common App that, you're, that you would like us to consider your test scores, please send them, because your application will be incomplete if we don't have them. Good point. And for North Shore, so you, we're not, you're not required to take the SATs or the ACTs. Um, you, our classes do require communications and math proficiency prior to registration, so students who do take um, the SATs or ACTs can submit those scores, and that can demonstrate proficiency so that you wouldn't need to take our placement test on campus. That's good to know. Thank you. Uh, Mary, what role does standardized testing play in the admissions <laughs> process? Anything else that you can um, add? You've talked about what test optional means, but if there's anything else that you can add to any of that discussion. Well, like anything, you know, grades, courses, level of courses, the better they are, the better they look. I mean, there's no other way to say that. But we are test optional. M many of the schools across the state are test optional. And the reason for that is because there has been research done that illustrates that some students score higher than other students. And so it's not always a fair review. So we really like to look at the test scores. And the only reason we, we didn't do it for nursing for a couple of years, but we did it for nursing because it became such a competitive market of grades of everybody who had a 4.0, no matter where they went to school. And so it's, it's really difficult for the admissions office to be able to know, is an A an A an A? Is an AP an A? Is an APA an APA? Is it a college level A? Did they do the dual enrollment? Did they do it with Salem State? Did they do it with Merrimack? Did they do it with Northern Essex? Is, you know, what does that mean? What was the teacher? Was it a high school teacher teaching a college level course? Was a college level course being taught by a college level course? So the process of the, uh, can I also say, all of us are in business to get you into college. All of us. We are not in business to keep you out. All right, so please know that. So everything that you're listening today, know that we are in the business of helping you get into college to become successful citizens. Okay, and so the SATs and the ACTs are all important, but they're just a single little part of the admissions process. So I hope that helps. It did, thank you very much. Can I add one thing just yeah. about test optional? So for UMass Lowell, and I think for and test optional, it always depends on the institution. So you, you're going to learn from tonight. You have to do your research on the schools that you'll be applying to. Um, because UMass Lowell is test optional for every major across the board. But you have to decide on your application. There's a question that asks, do you want your test scores to be considered yes or no? If you say no, we automatically require three short answer questions to be answered as part of the review process. Instead of receiving your test scores, we look at these questions with everything else in the application. Um, if you still submit your test scores, we'll never see them. They'll never show up on our application view. Uh, so there, for us, there's no point in, in sending those scores, especially if you have to pay for them. Um, but if you say yes, and then in March, you were like, I still haven't heard my decision yet. I applied back in December, and we're still waiting on your test scores. We can't review that application without your test scores. And once you hit submit on the application, um, you cannot change your testing preference. So you either you have to decide before you apply. Um, so that is something that I think is different across all the admissions offices that have test optional. So I would just definitely do your research on, on whether it makes sense to send them or not. And a good first stop for your research is fairtest.org, which is an up-to-date list of all of the test optional colleges and universities in the country. Great, thank you. Erica, what support systems are available for students who need help with their schoolwork? Yeah, so um, again, we talked about why students will choose North Shore, and there's a 
wide variety of reasons, but um, we do have a number of resources in place to assist students who need it. Um, and again, a lot of students are starting with us for that fresh start and new beginning. So we do have a fantastic accessibility services office for any student with a documented disability um, that's physical, emotional, um, and it's all one-on-one -on -one catered to the student. Um, that can be a huge resource, and the curriculum doesn't change, but you know there are resources available. Could be things like extended times on time on tests. It could be, you know, recording of lectures, things like that. Um, it's a great resource for students who need it, and it can be a great resource for students who are currently on an IEP. There is no IEP in college. Um, but these resources are one-on-one -on -one if the student does seek that out. Um, we also have tutoring on campus, and it's we have walk-in hours. We also have appointment-based tutoring. Um, we have crisis center. Um, one of the programs that I think is really fantastic, it's a state program called TRIO, um, and it really, it's designed for students who are either first generation, meaning neither of their parents attended um, or completed a bachelor's degree. It can be for low income students and it can be for any student with a documented disability. Um, and this is a program that really takes all of our resources from tutoring to accessibility services to um, student support and advising, and it's all one office. So the student will begin at North Shore and work with this office until they finish at North Shore, and it can really help students to succeed. Um, and many of those students transfer on and continue to com complete their bachelors. So that's a resource that I think is really important for some students who are, you know, are, are seeing North Shore as like their stepping stone to something bigger. Great, thank you. Sure. And Jackie, give us some advice about a college visit. What should I see, what should I do, and who should I talk to? Has anybody started the visit process yet? A couple of you, awesome. Anybody planning April vacation tours? Because that's usually <laughs> the biggest one, awesome. Um, so when should you go? I would say we get, um, all of us up here have um, a lot of students that visit in the February and April uh, vacation tours. So I know we're all accustomed to having a couple more tours a day, more tour guides on duty to accommodate that. Uh, we also, all, we all host spring visits. Uh, we have a junior preview day where students get to meet with faculty faculty, staff, they'll meet with people from members from the Honors College, students, so there's definitely events out there, um, and you'll know this once you join mailing lists for schools that you're interested in or start following their social media platforms. Um, open houses, there's a, uh, a lot of open house dates in the fall that are much more informational, so you'll maybe sit in, um, in a classroom, talk to the dean of the college or a faculty member, you'll get tour specific tours um, for the major that you're interested in that are student run. And then we host camp daily campus tours Monday through Saturday. Um, what's nice about our campus tours is they are all student run, so you're able to speak with a student who was in your seats just a few years ago, um, and they can talk about why they chose UMass Lowell or Northeastern Syracuse, whatever institution you're looking at. Um, and it's important for you to see the classrooms that you'll be in. Um, you'll wanna maybe check out the dining hall. <laughs> they must have been really excited about what I'm talking about, right? It was they the dining hall. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, if you're gonna be living on campus, what do the residence halls look like for freshmen? Um, what do they have available for the rec center, for what do the division one athletic fields look like, if that's something that you're gonna be interested in. Um, so just taking it all in, UMass Lowell has, uh, we have engineering specific tours, music specific tours, health specific tours, so you can see the nursing simulation lab. So uh, all of us up here, we're gearing our tours towards what you're looking for. Um, we also have tours that you can just come to campus just to see the residence hall and the recreation facility and what happens when you're on campus outside of the classroom. Um, and then we all give information sessions before the tours and the only people to ever ask questions are the parents. Uh, so hopefully once you're on campus and a student is giving the tour, um, definitely ask the questions that you're thinking of. Um, it's hard to say that a college is your number one choice if you haven't stepped foot on campus yet. So the visit is definitely the most important time. Um, can you see yourself there for 
four years, for six years, or are you thinking about doing a master's program at that institution? Um, so see, really seeing what the campus is like, what the culture and the community is like um, outside of just the classroom and, and having that ability to talk to students um, that, are, that are currently there, uh, I think is very important. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna move on to some toss-up questions. So would ever like to um, answer them, that would be great, or a couple of you. Um, and Jackie, you actually segued into this one really well. What is the role of parents during the search and application process? Obviously a huge part, right? Um, so like I mentioned, um, we have parents that drive the conversations when students are coming to visit. Um, but when you do work in admissions and you have a student that is driving those conversations, it just means so much more coming from the student. Um, when you have a parent call and they're like, I'm trying to fill out my son's application yeah. and, yeah. and that's the first thing you're like, well, when your son is ready to, to call me um, to talk about his application, I can't discuss anything um, about your son or daughter's application with anybody but the person applying. So um, the student really is the one that will be attending the university um, in the fall and unfortunately parents, you don't get to go back. So uh, you won't be there with them. So really letting them ask the questions, make the decision about what their number one choice is and um, always give your input. but hopefully they're making the right decision um, and just letting them ask the questions and uh, they'll have to learn to advocate for themselves on campus so um, kind of showing them how they can do that when they're seniors visiting campuses applying um, if a college requires an interview um, they'll be in the room doing that interview so it's really important to teach them how to advocate for themselves great did anybody else want to add to that it's okay if you don't all right. The other Sounds thing I would say is let the student fill out their application <laughs> on their own because I almost will promise the parents that you will get the wrong social security or the wrong <laughs> yes. birthday. Sure. And then you'll then someone's gonna call and say, Why isn't my son or daughter's application been reviewed? And we'll tell you because you know, we, we it's there's there's some information that's wrong on it. We'll call the guidance counselor and the guidance counselor may not know the social security number. So now you've just made the process that much longer. So I would ask that as parents, sit next to them if you want, but let them fill it out. All right, very good advice. So continuing a little bit on that, what are the best sources of information when starting the college search? What are some common mistakes or overlooked details um, of the college search? I think I kind of mentioned this earlier, but kind of getting caught up in the name brand or mainstream schools that everyone is looking at, feeling like, you know, someone else got in and you haven't gotten in, so you're behind. Um, I also know when I was in your shoes, I had all of these friends who were going to these campuses and saying, this is it, I knew right away, like this is where I was going to be, and I never had that feeling. I was torn between three schools, it was really tumultuous, I had a horrible time choosing, um, ended up working out really well, but if you don't have that immediate, this is it feeling, that's okay, you can like more than one place, you can dislike more than one place, um, but keep, again, keep that open mind, really take advantage of the current students. We are here to help you, to help the application process, to answer your questions, and to give you information, but I am not the one who is on campus all day, every day, participating in activities um, and I know it can be a little scary and intimidating when you're going on campus visits so I think one helpful um, if you're thinking about current students as sources of information is write questions down ahead of time so that when you're taking it all in and you're overstimulated and those kind of things you have that kind of cheat sheet to say all right these are the questions that I'm going to ask these are the things that are most important to me likely a lot of them will already be answered but take advantage of that time <clears throat> I think one mistake is kicking the financial can down the road, uh, at realizing the economic realities. I think uh, the families that are the most successful at this, uh, we talked about the role of parents. I think the metaphor for the role of the parent is the driving instructor with the student behind the wheel. Um, but uh, with that said, it's important to have the financial conversation with your student, you know, set limits if you have to, whether your income is 40,000 or 4 million, uh, there's, a, there's an affordability point that should be taken into account from the very beginning, along with what's the best academic fit, the best social fit, what is the best financial fit, um, and sources of information, uh, a mix, you know, like seeking, seeking medical advice, this is a good idea to get a second and even a third opinion through your research. 
Um, guidebooks are good, I think. Stay away from rankings. Ratings are okay, but stay away from rankings. Uh, the FISC guide is a particularly useful, good first place to start often. Uh, a website, collegedata.org, is a good website with just purely objective data and lots and lots of it. Uh, College Board, Big Future as a website can be useful. And parents and kids together should familiarize themselves with net price calculators at the colleges that they're looking at. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. Can I add to that? Yes. I think a lot of people don't think about this, and I know it's... It, but you need to realize that many students change their majors three times. Many students change their university or college throughout the four or five or six year process. Many students start and don't finish. And students need to know that they're paying for that. So if you leave or if you don't go to class or whatever, you're still paying for that. There's no writing it off. So parents need to understand that as well, to have conversations with their sons and daughters to say, this is a big expense. You know, this is more than a car. This is more than sometimes three cars. So to really have that conversation, because it, it has to be real. When you look at the student debt that's going on right now, I'm sure you all read the newspapers, students have to understand that if they walk away, they don't go to classes, they're throwing a lot of money out the window. So. Just a little tiny point of advice. That's great, thank you. What would be the best way to discuss extracurricular involvement, like service or work experience, any summer programs, or even family responsibilities? Where do they fit in all of this process? So they're definitely important for us. I think you'll hear the word holistic throughout a lot of your conversations, um, and we certainly take that into account. And um, kind of like we've touched on before too, we don't just, a, just a laundry list of things you've done at some point without any kind of indication as to what they are, what your role was, what was your engagement with it, it's not the most helpful. Um, so the way that we sometimes talk about it with students is if you're going to tell us about some activity that's meaningful to you, tell me it like I have no idea what it is and I have no idea what your role is. Explain it to me like I've never heard of this thing and you want to give me that full picture so that I can really understand so we understand you know if your parents work the nights and you are the one taking care of your younger siblings and you're talking to us about picking them up from school and making meals talk about your time management skills how you're showcasing leadership we see those all as things it is not a cookie cutter I'm the captain I'm you know this I'm student body president we do look at all of those things so explain to us those skills that you're using tell us why those things are meaningful um, and you know just provide all of that context all we get to see generally, at least at Northeastern, we don't do interviews, is that is you in your application. Um, we want you to be clear and concise, so please don't write us 20,000 pages about everything you've ever done ever, um, as nice as that would be. But we do want to understand what it is that you're doing and know that we do look at those range of things. So even if you think, you know, maybe me babysitting once a week is not that big a deal, it could be. Just think about how you'd want to put that into words. And there'll be an opportunity if you're filling out the common application, for example, obviously the listing of activities, but also there's an additional information section where you can put anything that your heart desires into that space. Um, so that's a place that you could put that information. Um, and interviews, if the school does offer it, is another place that you could do it. And some schools may allow you to submit a resume if you can't fit everything into the uh, activities portion. So that's, that would take a conversation with the admissions rep to see if that's something that the school would allow, but a place where you can submit more information as well. I, I was just gonna say that at Roger Williams, we actually capture through our system the level of the student's engagement in high school in general terms on a scale. And then we also mark with, if, if at least one of those activities has been sustained for all four years. So I would really encourage you, uh, whether it's a personal pursuit or whether it's something more organized, if it's meant, it's meant something to you and if you've invested time in it, maybe it's playing the flute or maybe it's playing volleyball, either one, uh, tell us how long you've been doing it and for how many hours a week. Try to think about that and give us an honest assessment. Great, thank you. What resources are available for students who might be having a difficult time adjusting to campus life? So there's a lot of support services on campus. Um, 
I think, think this question has a lot of different answers for it. So if you're struggling academically, um, there's for at UMass Lowell, and I know all these institutions have support services, but we have our Centers for Learning and Academic Student Success. It's free advising, free tutoring. Um, if you think you're in the wrong major and, and you want to talk to someone outside of, of your business or engineering, um, you can talk to these advisors to get out of that major, um, switch into undeclared or switch into a new major, switch out change your class schedule around um, without falling behind so um, and then the free tutoring uh, writing workshops and everything available for students um, and then I think um, if you're living on campus you have a resident advisor that lives right on your floor um, that they do training to to be a student mentor. So they're a, a peer mentor that they can talk to you about, are you having a fight with your roommate or is it something back home and you just need someone to talk to and you're in a new environment, you're in a new place, you don't know everyone. Um, so they, they really um, make themselves available and then there's resident directors that are professional staff members there as well. Um, and then I think mental health is important for um, everybody to discuss. Um, we have um, certified counselors on our campus. We have 24-hour emergency counselors on campus if a student needed that as well. Um, so th this is all available. It's all free um, and it's just students seeking those resources if they need to. Um, something nice that we implemented a few years ago um, it's a student at risk program, so it's called STARS. Um, it's completely anonymous, but if you're in a first year freshman class and you're coming to class every day and then halfway through the semester you stop showing up or you're coming in and you're not passing in your homework or you're just something in your demeanor has changed, a professor or a student um, can anon anonymously submit something to our counseling services um, about a student and it, it's at the complete discretion of that um, of our trained counselors, how they how they react to that, um, but it is something that we monitor um, because we want all of our students to to be doing well on campus, um, and I think it's something that we take pride in. Great, thank you. Um, one last question: Just if we could, people, someone could just please comment on campus safety. So I would guess that most of us have some kind of blue light system. So if you're not familiar with that, it's basically a big pull. And if you press the button, um, you know, emergency services will be dispatched. I know for us, we also have the NU Northeastern Police, um, but also we border Wentworth Institute of Technology, Simmons College as well. So it is basically just this hub of college students. So there is security present pretty much all the time from every school near us. And pretty much the only people in that area are other college students staff and they're also generally at most schools I think there's safe walks available I'm sure you all have those as well um, so there is a lot of a lot of campus safety opportunity I don't know if you guys have other things too but those are generally the ones to that most schools have and some schools may have an app uh, we have what's called the live safe app and one of the features is that you could follow your friend and watch them on your phone back to their place just to make sure that they made it back safely and parents can be on that too more importantly and Roger Williams campus is a little more sort of isolated in a way than the other uh, more urban, some of the more urban schools here, but we don't take safety for granted. We have our blue light system, we have our, our app. Uh, we, we, all colleges are required to publish any campus crime statistics from the year, and uh, you should you know, feel free to ask the colleges you're most interested in for that information just to see, but I think most of us are pretty comfortable <laughs> with the, the level of safety on our campus, but we don't take it for granted. I think one quick thing too is generally residence halls, only students have access to them through their ID card, so it's not like people from the general public can just be wandering into residence halls. They often lock off after a certain time. And the same even goes for our classrooms and academic buildings. So if you're staying there late one night, you know, people can't just walk in off the street into the classroom that you're in and plop themselves down. It's just for those students who have access. Great. And at Salem, you can actually call if you're, if you're out at, late at night somewhere within a certain radius and you need a ride or you're not safe, you feel uncomfortable, you can call campus police and they will come and get you or send um, one of our mentors over to, to pick you up if you're nervous. Um, in addition, at Salem, I don't know about anyone else, but our Salem campus police are actual police officers. They're the same equ yeah. equation as a Salem police officer, as a Salem state police officer. 
That's that the true? same for Yeah, they can, they can pull you over in Billerica, uh, anywhere yeah. in Middlesex yeah. County, so yeah. they are state trained yeah. police yeah. officers. It's the same for North Shore. So a lot of the state schools are truly, yeah. Yeah. truly police, police officers. Our campuses are Lynn and Danvers, and they are state police officers, and they do patrol not only the campus, but the surrounding neighborhood. Okay, so now it's time if you have questions. Yes. Start at a community college. <laughs> it yeah. That would be my advice. It really is a, um, a pretty incredible, you see a pretty incredible transition, I would say, and I think that there's a number of factors for that. Um, you see high school, there are, the reality is there are some high school students who just don't thrive, I would say, to their potential, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., right? So they arrive at community college, and you know the, the conversation regarding their schedule, um, it's really student-led. I mean, if they know they're not a morning person, or they learn really well online, or in the evening, or it's their first opportunity to go, you know, what works for me, you know? And I think we see students go from barely graduating high school to, doing unbelievably well at the college level, which sounds, but a lot of times, you know, your performance in high school just doesn't match your potential. And so um, the transformation can be incredible and it really can open up some amazing opportunities um, from there on. And just to add to that, many students who are very strong in high school go to the community colleges because they have more opportunity, more options for time in school, more options to, um, to travel to the school different times. Yeah. So the community colleges sometimes get a bad rap that it's the lower end students, like the old sure. vocational schools used to, and now everyone's dying to go to a vocational school. So I think you have to really understand that many students who are very strong academically go to the community colleges for two years, mm -hmm. and then they can save a, a tremendous amount of money. Yeah. And I think we all have transfer counselors in our schools, don't we? Everybody yeah. does. So it's not like they're not part of our community. They are very much a part of our community. The other thing I think, just to add to that quickly, is um, it's sort of what our counselors are prepared for. I mean, we're, we're hoping our students transfer. We can't offer them a bachelor's degree, you know? Um, and so, you know, we work very closely with a lot of, you know, the universities, whether it's with a transfer agreement or even just, you know, student by student, so. And, 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 oh, as, as, a pri <laughs> as a private, private four-year university, you know, we, we, if we're working with a student that we just don't feel comfortable admitting because we, we aren't confident in his or her level of success, it will depend on whether you're talking to a kid who's been struggling mightily and just can't pass Algebra two. Or is it a slacker dude who's got 15, 50 SATs and a C minus average? Um, either way, we will, uh, we have a counselor, and I assume others, we, we, if the student asks us, we will help them with a transfer plan, what you can do to make this a possibility for you. Uh, you're gonna have to do it somewhere else, but we can help you decide what to do and so forth. And I was just gonna add to that, um... A lot students put so much pressure on themselves so if you're comparing yourself to your best friend or sibling that is a 4.0 student not every student getting into four-year colleges are 4.0 students and maybe your strengths are um, you're a fantastic musician and you're applying for a music program or your your artwork and you're maybe looking at a um, art scholarship so you might have strengths in other areas including test scores but you're here, so it's not too late because you're a sophomore or junior. So in that junior or senior year, um, you could take classes and, and really um, put that work in and, and maybe stay after class and, and get some tutoring. And we look at that um, as an upward trend. And if you're um, so low that we really just can't admit you, we'll still see that upward trend. And students that are on an upward trend in high school continue on that upward trend once they get to college. So if you had a hard time adjusting from Miles River Middle School to Hamilton Wenham and you struggled in your ninth and 10th grade, but then junior year you really kicked it into gear and then you challenged yourself senior year, um, we'll note that and, and maybe you fall below our 
minimum requirements, but if everything else in your application looks good and, and you're on that upward trend, that's someone that we would bring to a second review. Um, and we all work in admissions, so we're trying to admit you or we're fighting for you as a student. Um, so just know that you still have maybe junior or at least senior year to, to really stay after, get that extra help, what you need to do, um, and then you'll hopefully continue that once you get to college to stay on that upward trend. Thank you. Other questions? Over here. How do you factor military experience in your application? Do you mean a transfer student, adult, like someone who's 19 right. or 20? Um, so we we have um, a lot of, of veteran students that apply to the university. So we have a whole um, veteran application process. So for students that um, do attend the military, we still have to review a student based on their academic history. So if they didn't go to college in between, we would be looking at their high school transcripts. And then we'd also be looking, did they receive any ACE military transcript um, that could possibly um, be used in the admission review process, um, or sometimes not very common, they could be receiving transfer credit for some of those courses. But it is typically a student reviewed on their high school transcripts. Um, and then if they've been out of high school, they could apply test optional for students that are outside of school, high school for over three years in the state of Massachusetts, all um, state and or all the public universities, UMass is in state, would um, or not require students to submit those scores. So it would be looking at the high school transcripts. Um, but if it's a if it's a student that would have gotten in two years ago, the military transcripts are only going to help them get in. It, it would never be um, a, a negative. Uh, aspect to the application. So we can't award credit for experience, so it would have to be based off of the ACE transcripts. All right, great, question up back. It depends. It's <laughs> true. It, it, it's, it's certainly not in and of itself a negative. It's a great thing. It would have done me a lot of good at 18, frankly. Um, it, it, it depends on what they do. Uh, some students just need a year to, to get away from school and to grow up and to, to have a little responsibility, to get some skin in the game, make some money. Uh, some kids uh, need a little academic bolstering, but not necessarily full time. Um, it can be it, it can be life changing, and you know whether the student wants to go through the admissions process while in high school and then go then defer and go on a gap year, or whether they want to defer the whole process for a year is really up to the student. Although I think it's a lot easier to apply and then defer. We had a student who was admitted. He was from King Philip, and uh, he admitted to the school. But then he told me, "Hey, I have this opportunity to go be the president of DECA." So I was like, yes, do that. Um, so we took the year off. We held his acceptance, and then he came to Syracuse this past year. I also, there's, um, we work with a number of students who come to us because they want to do a gap year, and they, they want to plug away at a couple of courses, you know, some of those courses that would transfer to another school. Um, they might take one or two um, and kind of get a feel for college credits, um, but not, again, like they said, be committing to any school um, really be taking that year off from a full-time perspective, but still kind of getting their feet wet and trying a course or two. So a lot of them will come in and register for a course or register for a couple of courses. Some end up staying and some, you know, take their year and, and will we'll take those credits and transfer them. Many students, too, are taking gap years during college, um, after the first year, after the first two years. Sometimes it's financial, sometimes again it's, it's a change of venue or just a cleansing of the palate or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh, what tactics would you recommend for remotely engaging with admissions or school or travel is just not possible? What do you mean by that? So you talked about like, following social, so I get that question. How do you, what are the tactics that individually engage with the admissions group or the school when you just can't travel? So a lot of schools have regional reps. <laughs> Did you want to speak a yeah, little sure. bit about that? Yeah, I mean, sure. Yeah, I mean, for us, like, we'll try to hit as many different states as possible. Um, and so we have regionals in, like, the New England area, 
um, to, in trying to cover a wide range, Los Angeles, Chicago, whatnot. And we'll, tra we'll also use our staff to travel to as many places as possible, too. Um, yeah, I think, well, for, for one, is that our, our hope is that we'll, we'll be at your school. But if not, if you're from further away, I would make sure, well, using technology to help as well. I mean, if you, I mean, you could Skype and have an, like a, an appointment with an admission staff member that way, or you could email or, or call. And we wouldn't uh, penalize, I guess, a, a student for being further out. So, and students wanted to, we wanted to diversify as much in terms of geography as possible, so. And most of us have pages on our websites that will say meet our staff or meet your counselor. And you put in your zip code and lo and behold, up pops the face made for radio. I'm your counselor. <laughs> uh, and, and then you can, it has my email address and my cell phone number. And so you know, that I'm gonna be the one to read your application so you can begin to engage me. And I love it. I wish more kids did it, frankly. Uh, our, whether, whether one is regional or not, and our staff, everybody is there. So if, you know, if, if you're from Connecticut, you're gonna see Joe Vario. If you're from Boston, you're gonna see Tanya Hurtado. If, you, if you're from Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, or Essex County, you're gonna see me. And I think most of us have something like that. Yeah. A lot of websites, too, college websites, will say, allow you to type in your area, and it will show you when that college representative will be here. So if there are big county fairs or like a, another big event, feel free to look. Usually registration lists are posted so you can see, yes, this rep from University of Colorado is going to be at that event. I can introduce myself. Um, I also know at Northeastern we do a ton of webinars. I'm doing two webinars next week where you can sit in, listen to different things. We do it for each of our colleges. You can ch type chat in questions. We get a list of who registered and who attended. Um, and also, too, if you just want to get a, a sense for the school and you're not sure of kind of what your interest level is just yet. A vast majority of institutions now have virtual tours where someone will walk you through and you can click right along and you can get the same student tour you would get on campus. So if you're just curious, do I like this building or what kind of, what's the student perspective? That's a really great place to start. Next Thursday night, there is a major college fair at the Boston Seaport and there will be hundreds, hundreds. of colleges there. Um, so that would be a great opportunity. It's from 6 to 8.30. I'll be there as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that might be a, a good way to see colleges that you may not see normally like in this area, but throughout the country. And there are literally hundreds. Maybe okay. even a thousand. Maybe even a thousand. <laughs> yeah. a big, maybe. It was 520 at oh. last count. So if, if you have a student who just keeps saying to you, I want to go to California, <laughs> they can probably go to the fair and see who's in California and then they might realize how far away it is. <laughs> might come back here. All right. Yes, question. While they're in college or before they get to college? Okay. Um, I think we all probably would take whatever at, at Salem, for example, I'll just use Salem. At Salem, for example, we do have many foreign exchange programs for a student who wants to do international travel, do a semester abroad. We have offices that do that. I've got to assume we all do. Um, if you want to do it in high school, I'd tell you to talk with your high school guidance counselor because there are agencies that do it through the high school. Um, but if you're looking to do a, a study abroad with transfer credit, I would tell you to do it while you're at the school that you're attending to ensure that the courses that you take in Israel, for example, will transfer back and become part of your program. Is that out? Okay. Yes. It seems all the recent talk in the media about the <laughs> um, is going to incur a reaction that should hit you guys right about when our applications do. How is this going to impact what we're starting right now? I'm going to answer that as, as probably the most senior person of admissions. Um, there is nothing in the admissions scandal that brings it to an admissions office. Okay, so there's no one in the, right now, at least no one on the, in the news, that has actually been an admissions officer or an admissions dean. No, but if you have a kid that has an athletic background or perhaps an IEP or something else that was clearly involved, it happens. Uh, you're going to be using other people's input to be 
gauge this student's ability to function in your college. That they did use. And I guess I'm wondering what rules are I would on us as we fill this out. I don't see anything. Do you see anything? No? Okay, good. That's great. I can guarantee you one thing. Nobody will ever have to pay $50,000 to get into Roger Williams. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe Bill. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. Oh, one last question. <laughs> On that note. So, our, so maybe I can tell my our international students. How are they? How are international students versus American students viewed in the pool of applicants? Right. So okay. So for residency, um, for, for UMass Lowell, we're a public institution in Massachusetts, so uh, in-state students has, have a lower tuition cost. Um, so that would be dependent on um, kind of overall residency. But you'd be look, your daughter would be evaluated based on where she's in high school. So we evaluate applications. Every student that, um, set, every counselor that sends a transcript also sends the school report. Um, so everybody is familiar with the high school. So she'd be evaluated and looked at based off of her high school and, and the students that are also graduating from Hamilton Wenham. Um, so the evaluation process would be the same for all students at Hamilton. Did Agreed. she take courses same. in China? Did you go to high school in four years? years. Oh, all four, four years. years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, one last question. <laughs> Yes. No. <laughs> yes and no. There you go. <laughs> it, it depends. So it depends. It depends. <laughs> I think it depends the extent to which the grades yes. are being impacted. And I think there is, I mean, even if she can lessen involvement in something for even a couple semesters and just see if that makes a difference, it doesn't mean she has to give up everything. Again, most of us are looking at the whole piece of the student, so we will see that. But um, I would say if it, if it really is, I, I would encourage maybe taking a step back from something um, and, you know, can still talk about what that means to her in the application, but showing that, you know, prioritization is, is important. All right, I'd like to thank our panelists for coming out tonight. Thank you very much for coming to our community. Um, and thank you, parents and students, for also coming out. If you had any other questions, I'm sure they'll stick around. Um, and good luck with all that process. Make sure you come and see us down in Guidance. We're here to help you. <laughs>